Now we're going to be starting a new series this morning. Uh, we're going to be turning to the book of Romans, Paul's uh, great letter, and we're going to read the introductory part of that, uh, which is in chapter 1, verses 1 uh, to 7. We're going to call the series The Gospel of God. That will come as no surprise when you see that that uh, phrase actually jumps right out of the first few verses uh, of our reading. So, Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you, who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. May God's word uh, touch our hearts as we think about it this morning. Uh, the book of Romans is, is Paul's great exposition. It's his great description of the gospel of God in all its fullness. He explains what that gospel is. He talks about all its repercussions and all its implications uh, for the people of God. And in fact, I'll go as far as saying that nowhere else in our New Testament do you get such a full and a well-developed and logical discussion and description of the gospel uh, in all its fullness? So it's, it's something that's massively important for us in understanding the gospel. I mean, if I were just to give you a very brief little overview, because sometimes having that kind of bird's eye view is quite helpful before we come to the detail. One of the points that he makes, if you just look down... Um, at verse number 16 and 17. It talks about there that the gospel in verse 17 is about the righteousness of God being revealed. And that is probably the key word in the whole of the book. The gospel is to be understood not in terms of my happiness. It's not to be understood in terms of how it fulfills me or what it does for me. I mean, these things come into it, but it's not the heart of it all. The key point that he uses in describing the gospel is that it is a gospel where the righteousness of God is being revealed. And that word can be used to kind of summarize the way the whole book is developed. And so, for instance, you'll find that from chapter 1 right through to chapter 3 and verse number 20 you'll get the idea being developed that, you know, we need this righteousness. We are lacking in righteousness. There's no one righteous, not even one. And so the requirement for righteousness is developed in these first three chapters. And then from chapter 3 and verse 21, you'll see the word comes up there. He says, but now the righteousness of God has been revealed and so righteousness is now going to be revealed. This righteousness that we need, but that comes from God. And he will develop that point wonderfully from this point on in chapter 3 right through to chapter 8. That's the second division of the book. And then at that point, from chapters 9 through to 11, there are certain questions that are raised. And these questions all have got to do about fairness, you know, and the sovereignty of God. Is, is God actually fair? Is it right that he should deal in certain ways with, with individuals uh, as well as with nations? And so all of that is juggled around in quite a difficult passage 
between chapter 9 and 11. But the, po the point is answered that God is righteous. His sovereignty and the way that he acts is done in a righteous manner. And then the final division of the book from chapter 12 to the end. These are the practical applications. How, how can righteousness or should righteousness actually be worked out in the detail of everyday life? And so that, that's the way the whole book, you know, very simply, basically is, is structured and outlined. I mean, if you were to look at the book from a historical point of view, the impact of Romans has been massive. You know, the, uh, the Reformation with uh, Martin Luther at its helm uh, in 1515, you know, this monk, you know, part of the established church at the time with all its, you know, smoke and mirrors and confusion and corruption of the Bible. In his, in his little room in Wittenberg in Germany, he starts to read the book of Romans for himself. And in particular, the verse that jumped out to him uh, was, was, was this one in verse 17 that we talked about. The righteous, the, the righteous shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And Martin Luther said at that, that occasion that it was like a gateway to heaven that was opened up to him. It just shone in his cell. And it just opened up the whole Bible to him. And that was the catalyst for this tsunami. The Reformation when the gospel was rediscovered again out of the darkness of those times. And it just shook the world when Martin Luther rediscovered the message of the book of Romans by which we can in fact interpret the whole Bible. And so it is massively important if you just look at it from a historical point of view. But it's important for ordinary people like you and me as well. I mean, children over the years have been taught, and I, I was one of them, to memorize key verses from the book of, of Romans. You know, verse, verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and, caught and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 10 and 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. These wonderful golden verses all from the book of Romans that capture the gospel in its essence. And so it is, I don't think I can overstate the point of how important this book is. And I would like to think that for us, as we come to it, that we rediscover, for many of us, the joy and the glory of the gospel message. It's, I mean, it's what we all need, Christians, and certainly for folks who are not believers. It's the gospel that is the greatest need of the hour. That is what is required above everything else in our world today. It is the wonderful message of the gospel as much needed today as in Martin Luther's time or as in the time when it was originally written away back in the first century when Paul penned these words to people in Rome for people in Aberdeen it's something that is just equally as crucial that we grasp its message again this this wonderful book so this morning just a couple of points as we go down this introductory section what I really want to look at is, first of all, how he introduces the gospel. And then secondly, how he introduces himself. Uh, and he does that in respect to the gospel. So he introduces the gospel and he introduces himself. So let, let's just go down some of the verses here and just learn from that. He introduces himself, first of all, as Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus. Now, I mean, a servant is uh, usually a hired hand, you know, someone who's paid a wage, <coughs> someone who has a decision as far as whether he wants to work for somebody or chooses to move on to some other different occupation. He gets his wage at the end of the week 
and, um, and it's his choice to some extent. That's not the idea here at all. The idea here is bond servant. It's the idea of a slave. And he uses that word to describe his relationship to Christ. Now, many people would have looked on that as being a kind of negative connotation, but not Paul. He, see, he sees himself as someone who belongs to Christ. Christ has authority over him. Christ is his master. Um, he is not his own. He has been bought with a price. And so he has to honor Christ. Now, later on in the book, chapter 6 in particular, he'll talk about the fact that humanity, human beings, are, are slaves to sin. Slaves to sin which kind of dominates the way they live their life, the way they think, and the things that they do. In contrast to that, being a slave of Christ is a freedom. And this kind of slavery produces real freedom in our lives. Not a negative thing, but something that is positive. And that is a concept that he's going to try and bring in as far as all his listeners are concerned. As far as anyone who listens to the gospel, including ourselves. Who am I? I'm a slave. That's how we should be looking at ourselves. I'm a slave of Christ. That is another way of saying that you are a Christian. That you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're not your own. He has bought you with the price of his own blood. Therefore we honor him and we live for him. He then says that he's called to be an apostle. <clears throat> the word calling is, 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 is an interesting word because it's used in a number of ways in the New Testament. I mean, we can think of it just in terms of, you know, you call to somebody. You know, you, you, you shout to them, you know. Uh, but it's, call, it's, it, it's used in a different way in Scripture in addition to that. It's, it's a kind of irresistible call. It's, a, it's what the theologians often refer to as an effectual call. Is that when God really speaks and calls into the hearts of an individual, he will draw them irresistibly to himself. Because you see, when people come to a knowledge of Christ, it's not just a matter of amassing information. It requires the work of God's Spirit to convict us of the truth of the message and to see the, the greatness and glory of Christ, the Savior, the Redeemer of the world. And we can't really appreciate any of that without God's work, God's call. And in fact, that's how we understand the word church. Because the word church, ecclesia, actually means those who have been called out of our world to stand with Christ. You know, it's almost as if God has issued a call a call not in the sense of, oh, here's an invitation you might wish to consider, but as a command that we have to obey and to step away from our world and to stand with Christ. That's what the church is, those who are called out. Well, he's described here as being called in that sense to be an apostle. Called to be an apostle. Apostle of course, in a very specific sense, referred to those who walked with Christ, who were observers and witnesses of his life, death, resurrection. Paul was the last apostle in that sense, the one who was called and sent, commissioned by Christ, the last of the apostles. He met him on the road to Damascus. He saw the risen Christ and he was commissioned by Christ to be his ambassador before all nations, specifically as the apostle to the Gentiles. He spoke to Jews, but principally his message and role was to come to those beyond the boundaries of the Jewish religion. We'll touch on in the significance of that uh, later on. So we think about, we reflect on this idea of being called by God ourselves. God's call, his command that comes to us to be obeyed this morning. And now he turns to introduce the gospel of God itself. That's what he says. Called to be an apostle, set apart 
for the gospel of God. Now that's, of course, a crucial statement. You know, this wasn't Paul's little manifesto. This wasn't Paul's big idea for the time. You know, brilliant man, although he was. What he brings is the gospel that belongs to God. The, the gospel that originated, that initiated with God. And, and that's, that's the wonder of the whole thing. That he brings this message that is God's message. And he, he's going to bring it and expand and describe and apply it to, to us as well as the readers away back in that time. And this is what he says then. Here's, here's his introduction about the gospel of God. Number one. The gospel was promised before through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures. This is not a surprise. You know, if we go back to our Old Testament, in fact, he's going to do that uh, in the first few chapters here. That, that great phrase that I mentioned from uh, verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. That wasn't news. That comes from the prophecy of Habakkuk in our Old Testament. He presented that to the people. And now what Paul is doing, he's taking what the prophets had talked about in the Old Testament scriptures, and he's going to shine a further light on it and develop it further. And he's going to show how that is all revealed in the person of Christ himself. And so we have this wonderful integrity, this, this cohesion of the scriptures from beginning to end. In chapter 3, if you, if you were to flick down there, you'll notice how there are a whole range of scriptures that are quoted from the Old Testament substantiating the fact that we have need of righteousness. In chapter 4, he cites Abraham. He quotes David. And he gives all of these things as part of this whole idea that this gospel of God was promised. And here now is this promise fulfilled and it materializes and is manifested in the gospel that I now proclaim to you. Secondly, the gospel, verse 3, the gospel of God is concerning His Son. All right? And, and here's the, the wonderful heart of the gospel. It's, it's all about the Son of God. Everything about the gospel converges on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And it's not a list of rules. You know, it's not a list of items that we have to tick off. It's not points of adherence that we have to somehow or another bring into our lives. It's all focused on our relationship with the Son of God. That is the gospel. It is concerning His Son. We must never lose sight of that point. Everything is concerning His Son as far as the gospel is concerned. And two things He says here, actually, about His Son. Well, three. First one, He was descended from David according to the flesh. And the point that's being really made there is the physical humanity of Christ. That Christ, the Son of God, is both human and is divine. And both these points, of course, are absolutely crucial. To be a savior of sinners, to be the savior of humanity, he himself has to become human. And so that happens at Bethlehem, the incarnation. God himself is manifest in flesh in the person of his Son, and so you go to, for instance, Matthew chapter 1, and you read down that big list of names, the genealogy, the DNA test of the first century, to absolutely prove without, de without any doubt whatsoever the humanity of Christ descended from David, from King David, the true king of Israel. But not just the humanity of Christ is important, what is also important is to see that he's not just an important person, not just in the line of kings, not just a teacher, but he is deity. And so he is descended from David according to the flesh, but he is declared to be the son of God in power through his resurrection. And so the son of God bursts out of the tomb on the third day. This is not just a man. Here is somebody who has power that is stronger than death. And the power of God's Spirit, interestingly, you'll have observed there that the triune God is mentioned here. 
Father, Son, and Spirit, all at work together as far as this great gospel is concerned. And the power of Christ and his deity is demonstrated in that unique event, which is the resurrection of Christ. Nothing stronger than death. You know, we see these figures that have been quoted to us over this last you know, year and a half, the number of deaths that have taken place. The last enemy. What could be stronger than death? And Christ is stronger than death. And because Christ lives, those who believe in him will live as well. Yes, we might pass through the article of death, but we will pass through that. And we will live because Christ lives. And and the deity and the power of the gospel of Christ is emphasized here. And of course, that's something that will be emphasized time and time again. Again, if you go down to verse number 16, he uses that word there. Not ashamed of this gospel. Why should I be ashamed or embarrassed about this gospel? It's the power of God unto salvation. Lots of powerful things. You know, the, 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 the word dynamite actually comes from the word that is used here. There are also powerful ideas, powerful influencers, powerful people in our world today. I want to say that there's nothing that is so powerful as the message of the gospel. It is the only thing that brings salvation saves us from our situation of being estranged from God with all the corruption of our ideas and our thoughts and our lives that he's going to expand on here over these next few chapters. The only thing that can save us from all of that is is the power of this gospel. And so this message comes to us with massive encouragement today. It's the wonderful truth that we should all hang on to that irrespective of what is happening in our lives that we think is strong, you know, the discouragement, the, the sense of failure and guilt and the depression that can often be part of that, that there is the power of Christ's gospel that can, it can explode things out of our life and bring us into the kingdom of God with all the blessings attendant to that. And he's going to step by step walk us through all of that. The wonderful power of the gospel to save us completely. And then he says, and this was the third point that I just wanted to make. He uses the full title and name of Christ. He says, by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So, All of these titles and names, of course, are full of so so much meaning. Jesus, the Savior, you'll call his name that because he'll save his people from their sins. Christ, the Greek form of Messiah, the long-promised Messiah and King. And Lord, the idea there is the Sovereign One, the Master, the Lord. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul would write there that, you know, one day every knee will will bow before him and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he puts all of that together. This is who he is. This is who my gospel is about. It's about Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that is the name that Christian people, bond servants of Christ, slaves of Christ, take upon their lips willingly. He is our Savior and Lord. But once again, what he now does is he turns back to himself and he introduces himself. And he does that in terms of the gospel. And he's also going to turn to the readers and he's going to refer to them in terms of the gospel as well. So what he says is this, In verse number 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith. Remember I said that about this idea of calling. It's It's really not just all about here is an invite to you. 
God commands us. He expects us to obey. It is the obedience of faith that is required as the gospel is proclaimed, the gospel of God. And faith means that I take God at his word. I don't rest on my own achievements or my own ability or my own goodness, but I rest completely on Christ. I have belief in what God says and what he has done, and I accept that wholeheartedly. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. The just, if you're going to live, you'll have to live by faith. That's what he says. Faith is the only way. And so, as far as the readers are concerned, and by extension ourselves who listen in this morning, we are called to the obedience of faith. It's good to reflect on that, just to ask that question of ourselves. Have I obeyed the gospel? And is that obedience characterized by faith in Christ? That's certainly how he tries to extend that here. And then he says, the obedience of faith for the sake of his name. For the sake of his name. Paul wasn't all about personal aggrandizement. Wasn't about fame or glory as far as he was concerned. The motivation in the preaching of the gospel of God was for the glory of God. It was for the sake of his name. That God would be honored. Now, you know, there, there, there will come a day when we will all stand before God. And the thing that will be assessed more than anything else is not necessarily the things that we have done, but it is the motivation that, has lay, uh, that lies behind what we do. And, and, and we often try to work that out and get it, get it wrong in people. But God, of course, searches our hearts. And he will know why we have done things. Was it for myself? You know, was it because people would give me a little round of applause or think highly of me or whatever? Or was it done for the sake of his name, for his honor, that his name might be, might be worshipped? And it's good for us, again, just to reflect on our, on our motivation. And then he says, among all the nations... All the nations. Now, this is actually a very significant point in what we have here. Because there is, as you read through the book of Romans, you'll find that there's a tension. There's always a little tension. And the tension is this. It's first century. All right? And up until this point, mainly the gospel has been received by Jewish converts. And, and they're a bit reluctant and they're a bit hesitant and they're a bit uncertain about people who are non-Jews coming into the fold, so to speak. And there's a big ruckus and the early church have to meet in a big convention in, 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 in Acts chapter 15 to try and sort all of this out. And even in Rome, the center of the empire, where the, the church has been formed, there, there is this tension between Jewish and Gentile believers and he has to address this on a number of occasions all the way through. So, for instance, you will see that in verse number 16 again. It's the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. And he's going to take all of this up. And that's why he makes this point in the introduction that it is among all the nations. Here is a message that is for all. He says to them in verse 7, that uh, to all those who are in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. So if I, we can take a little step back just to put this in some sort of context. Um, if you were to read, you might even want to flick to it in chapter 15. You'll see there that Paul's plan was, was actually to come to Rome uh, almost as a transit lounge. He's currently in Macedonia or, uh, or Greece. He's about to go to Jerusalem to give a gift to the poor. And his plan is to come to Rome. But he only plans to come to Rome so that he can then go to Spain after that. He talks about how all round about that area, the Mediterranean, he's fully preached the gospel of Christ, even up to Illyricum, which is present-day Albania. So he plans to extend the gospel to all the nations. 
that the people might hear this tremendous message that is the power of God to salvation. And he's not bothered what nationality you come from. I mean, if you go into chapter 16 of Romans and flick down some of the names there, you'll get a whole eclectic group of different names, some Jewish, some Greek, some Roman. And you'll find that there are different social settings that are mentioned. The lady that actually brings the letter by hand is a lady called Phoebe, you know, and she she actually physically brings the letter. You'll see that there are a couple of people who are involved in the writing of the letter in chapter 16. Um, And verse number 23, and he puts together a man who is the, the city treasurer called Erastus and our brother Quartus. In fact, there are, there are two kind of uh, numerical names in this passage. There's a, a man called Tertius, verse 22, and there's this man called Quartus. And you know what these names mean? They mean number three and number four. And they were probably slaves who were not given personal names at all. They were just given numbers. You're number three, slave. You're number four. Tertius and Quartus. And yet they're put together with the guy who is the treasurer of the city as part of the church of God. Those who are loved by God. This message that is for all the people, for all the nations. And the message that comes to us today. Now, there it is in an introduction uh, this morning. The gospel of God. What it is. And what it should mean as far as I am concerned. It should have an implication as far as a sense of wonder and joy. A sense of confidence in its power to save. And a sense of unity. That's the last point there. It's, it's the basis, the gospel is the basis of unity. Despite our many viewpoints and backgrounds and all the rest of it, it draws us together in Christ. And so this book here has his enormous potential for change and for blessing in all our lives. I gave you a wee historical point earlier on. I'm going to give you another one. We're not in the 1500s this time. We're in the 1700s. 1738, the 24th of May, in Aldersgate Street in London, which you can still go to, John Wesley attends a meeting. And Martin Luther's commentary on the book of Romans is being read. At this stage, Wesley's a a religious man, but but he's actually not a true Christian. He's gone back and forward as a missionary to America by old sailboats, on a couple of times, he was greatly impressed by the, the faith and the attitude of, of people who were known as Moravians, you know, um, and he didn't have what they had. And so on that particular night, he hears this man read from the preface of Luther's commentary to Romans. And, th- and this is how he wrote in his journal after it. He said, as I, as I heard that, the gospel of God... I felt my heart strangely warmed. You know, and and he dated his conversion to that point. Warmed by the gospel of God. I mean, I mean that's what should happen to all of us. Our hearts to be warmed by this glorious message. Let's not leave that to history. Let's make that now and real and vibrant and living for us. I could give you the date and the time of a, of a man who, who gave me his own reaction to the book of Romans. We had gone through this in our BSF, Bible Study Fellowship class. And uh, it was the time for sharing at the end of the study of the whole book. This is just a few years ago. And he said this to me. He said, this is, this is, this is what I've learned uh, from going through Romans. He said, my, my, my house has been taken apart. All the building bricks of my life have all been knocked flat as I've I've read this book. 
but they've been rebuilt again. <laughs> a new house has been built, rebuilt, knocked down, built up again. When I've come to understand the heartwarming message of the gospel of God from the book of Romans. I really hope that we have that kind of experience ourselves as we continue with the study of this wonderful book. May God bless you all and let's pray. Lord, how grateful we are to have the words of your gospel before us concerning your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our glorious Redeemer. We pray that as we sang earlier that it will be in Christ alone that all of our hope will be found. Resting resolutely, four squarely on Christ and his finished work, knowing that no one is comparable There's nowhere else we can go for the words of eternal life. Thank you for this tremendous gospel. We pray that it will have living implications in all our lives and in our society, our community. Bless us, we pray, with the sense of this heartwarming message as we leave here today, as we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.